Aristotle believes that fulfilling our human function requires cultivating virtue, and consequently, the concept of virtue is vital for understanding Aristotle's ethics. Broadly speaking, virtue, or arete, refers to the excellence of a thing. And of course, Aristotle's primary concern is with human excellence and with the human virtues. Now, importantly, there are two types of human virtue. There are intellectual virtues, and there are virtues of character, or what are also called moral virtues. So, some excellences concern a person's mind and intelligence, while others concern a person's character, feelings, and actions. This distinction can be seen as following from the fact that humans have an intellect, or capacity to know what is true, and a will, the capacity to make choices about how to act. Consequently, there should be some set of excellences pertaining primarily to the intellect, and then another set of excellences or virtues pertaining primarily to the will. The intellectual virtues are excellences in the realm of pursuing truth and obtaining knowledge. Someone who is intellectually virtuous would excel at discovering truth. They would be the sort of person who really strives to believe what is best supported by the available evidence. By contrast, moral virtues deal with acting or reacting in the proper way in a given situation. Someone with an excellent character will resist vicious temptations and act appropriately in whatever circumstances they happen to face. Qualities like judgment and practical wisdom are given by Aristotle as examples of intellectual virtues. Open-mindedness, intellectual humility, curiosity, and a desire for truth would also count as intellectual virtues. Aristotle cites generosity and temperance as moral virtues. Honesty, courage, justice, kindness, and loyalty would be other examples. Each of these enables someone to act properly in a particular situation. The generous person, when confronted with the reality of poverty, would choose to give to the right recipients in the right amount and at the right time. The temperate person who controls their pursuit of pleasure would indulge in the pleasures of food and drink in the right amount at the right time and again in the right situation. When considering the concept of virtue, generally what first comes to mind are the virtues of character. Qualities like honesty, dependability, courage, generosity, kindness, and justice. And furthermore, Aristotle clearly does think that there is something importantly different about these moral virtues. To say that someone is unwise or has poor judgment is not quite the same as making a remark about that person's moral character. It is one thing to say that a person has poor judgment, it is another thing to say that a person is dishonest, cowardly, or cruel. In addition, it isn't really all that uncommon to say that someone can be a good person despite lacking a high-level intellect or even lacking a little bit of common sense. Yet, this difference notwithstanding, there are still good reasons to count qualities like good judgment and intellectual curiosity as virtues. We do praise other people for their wisdom, judgment, and intellect. Consequently, these traits seemingly must contribute to human perfection. We would expect that the best human being would possess qualities like these. Yet, despite the fact that the intellectual virtues are genuine virtues, these qualities are excluded from our moral character. When we recognize someone's good character, Aristotle doesn't think we are recognizing their wisdom or intelligence. And we can understand why Aristotle would think this. Intelligence, for example, is praiseworthy and admirable. It is a quality anyone would include if asked to imagine the ideal human. However, in many cases, a person can possess an intellectual virtue without that quality necessarily influencing their actions. 
Someone with good judgment may excel at identifying the best means for her desired end, but that doesn't mean she will invariably act in that way. She might be too lazy to enact her well-crafted plan, or she might lack the fortitude necessary to see it through. Notice how this makes good judgment different from a moral virtue like honesty. The person who merely understands that they should not tell a lie, but in practice is a habitual liar, would not be considered honest. Likewise, the generous person must actually give resources to those in need. The courageous person must actually face present danger. Consequently, we can see the grounds for separating the intellectual from the moral virtues. Still, there is also reason to call this distinction into question. There are certain cases where it seems like a praiseworthy quality of our intellect should, in fact, be seen as part of our moral character. Consider a virtue like intellectual humility. Those who possess this quality understand the limitations of their own knowledge, are willing to admit when they might be wrong, and seek the knowledge and expertise of others. Furthermore, while intellectual humility does clearly pertain to our intellect, it also clearly influences our actions. Someone with intellectual humility will not act arrogantly, nor will she immediately dismiss the ideas of others. She will listen to and collaborate with those possessing some expertise she lacks. In all these ways, intellectual humility, just like honesty, generosity, and courage, requires certain habits of concrete action. Thus, the distinction between intellectual and moral virtue may not be quite as clear as it could initially seem. But let's put aside for the moment the question of whether a strict distinction can be drawn between moral and intellectual virtues. To conclude this video, let's consider some possible implications of the idea that the qualities of intellect can count as virtues or vices. Ultimately, the reason Aristotle considers intellectual excellences to be virtues, despite not being considered moral virtues, is because intellectual excellence is a part of human excellence. And furthermore, the cultivation of human excellence, insofar as it is possible, is supposed to be the end of the ethical life. Yet, if this is true, then what we mean by the ethical life might be much broader than we typically think. Consider again the trait of intelligence. Intelligence is a perfection of the human intellect that has a particular sort of character. Specifically, intelligence is commonly seen as a natural ability. To a large extent, although not entirely, intelligence is something that people are born with. Environmental factors and effort will always play a role in the development of a person's mind, but those with truly outstanding intellects are often fortunate enough to have been born with a great gift. This fact poses a broader question. To what extent are virtues similar to natural abilities? We know that Aristotle compares the virtues to skills in areas like athletics or music. And we all acknowledge that, like intelligence, excellence in these areas is, to a significant extent, something a person is born with. So, does that mean that some people are born with a greater aptitude for certain virtues? Will certain virtues always be out of reach of the common person who has been born with common talents and average abilities? Is it appropriate to classify a natural ability as a virtue in the first place? Would that commit one to the rather repugnant claim that natural disabilities then should be considered vices? Ultimately, does the achievement of human virtue, excellence, and flourishing require the possession of natural abilities that are beyond our control? These are important questions if we want to understand what precisely is entailed in our pursuit of virtue and in our pursuit of the moral life. 
And these are also precisely the questions I take up in a follow-up video entitled Natural Abilities, Moral Greatness, and Heroic Virtue. You can find a link to that video in the description section below. What we will have to contend with is the possibility that certain kinds of virtue, though not all kinds of virtue, may be out of reach for the average person. That for a certain strand of virtue, specifically heroic virtue and the virtues of greatness, these may not be susceptible to cultivation through practice and habit formation. And this is a conclusion which, if correct, may sit uncomfortably with us. And this is because it would seem to call into question certain democratic and egalitarian assumptions that modern people typically make about what constitutes the ethical life.